Hello, YouTube. Well, I want to congratulate you. The day has finally arrived. You and I are finishing up a basic course for testers, tester from scratch on a topic like Agile. And we're going to take a closer look today at one of the most popular frameworks that is used in Agile, which is Scrum. There are also a number of others, which we won't be emphasizing today. If you're interested in learning more about them, we can talk about them in the next few sessions. So what is Agile in general? Agile is a, a set of methods and principles. Agile project management, let's call it that. You and I remember the basic methodologies and software development models that we covered a long, long time ago in one of our very first lessons on the topic of testing from scratch. The link to this lesson will appear just above. That is, we talked to you about the waterfall model, about V model, about iterative models. It is the iterative model that is fundamental, let's say, in Scrum, in this framework. What are these agile project management methods good for? As we remember in the waterfall model, all the stages of development followed each other. That is first, for example. There was gathering ideas, writing requirements, then there was development, and then there was testing, and we could not return to the previous stage if we were already at one of them. That is, we had to start everything from the very beginning. Beginnings, what are these agile methods good for? Because we can change our requirements, we can go back to the previous stages of our software development without having this interconnection with other stages. That's why in the year 2000 and 117 developers got together somewhere in a resort, if I'm not mistaken, either in Canada or in America, and collected all their comments on how they work with agile methods in development. So we wrote what we call the Agile Manifesto. In this Agile Manifesto, there are four fundamental values which became the progenitor of further all these frameworks and in general the Agile system itself. The first is that people and interaction are more important than processes and tools. What does that mean? For example, if your team has some principles, structures, tools, conditions that can hinder your work, then you need to get rid of them. The most important thing is that people should themselves choose the way of this organization, a set of some processes, tools, and it is these tools and processes that should help the work, not hinder it. That is why we first of all pay attention to people and interaction. But right away, I would like to point out the fact that even when we say that something is more important than something else, we do not forget that processes and tools must still be present in our project management, and we cannot somehow work without them. The same goes for the other clauses. For example, the next value, that a working product is more important than exhaustive documentation. That is not to say that we shouldn't have any documentation at all on a project. But this documentation should not be redundant, and we should not spend a huge amount of time and resources on it. The main thing for us is to deliver our working product, our functionality directly to the customer. That's our number one challenge. So sometimes we can sacrifice exhaustive documentation. But again, we can't exist without documents either. The next value is cooperation with the customer is more important than agreeing on the terms of the contract. What does this mean? Again, there should not be any redundant attachments to our contracts, any documentation that regulates our relationship with the customer. That is, we should first and foremost pay attention to the fact that we are comfortable cooperating with each other. We do not want to spoil our relations with our customer. Therefore, any of our documents, agreements, contracts, and so on should contribute to maintaining a positive relationship with our customers, but in no way should they spoil it. So that's what is embedded in this value. And lastly, the willingness to change is more important than strictly following the original plan. So even if we have some kind of project plan, if we have some requirements spelled out Clearly, we should always keep in mind that we will still have some changes over time. Even if, for example, we had some user story that we implemented in some past iteration, but still over time the business may have other needs. 
this functionality may solve some other tasks in the future. It may need to be extended. So it is important to remember that there are always changes in Agile, and in principle, this system was created for this purpose. Also, in addition to these four values, there are 12 principles in the Agile Manifesto, but we are not going to dwell on them in more detail, because in fact, they just clarify these four values. And I will definitely leave a link to this Agile Manifesto that you can read. Everything that concerns principles, everything that concerns values will be described there in great detail. That is, you and I are doing a small overview, looking at how these processes can be implemented in your company, what ceremonies there will be, what there are rallies, meetings, artifacts, and so on, so that you will not be afraid when you come to the project. And for example, you will be invited to some iteration planning. That is, uh, you will not be afraid of this rally. You will know what objectives are pursued. It is this rally for you, for the tester, as a member of the development team, that later on you will be trained how these processes are organized in your company. That is, not always companies use pure Scrum. There are some enhancers, for example. Something is not used in the Scrum that you have in your company. Of course, this is not quite right because we are going to talk about pure Scrum now and all these modifications. Do not allow us to say that your company used exactly the following. Pure Scrum here. These are, let's say, the initial things that you should generally know about Agile, about the Agile Manifest. Principles and values. Next. As we can see, we've got 47 items today that we need to cover within Scrum of this framework. So the session is likely to turn out to be quite long, but I think it will be useful for you so that you will not be afraid of this name and this framework in your work in the future. There are three such main parts in Scrum. That is the Scrum team. These are the events that we have in Scrum and the artifacts. These are the ones that we're going to talk about in detail now. There are also various metrics that allow us to evaluate the effectiveness of your team, the effectiveness of each individual team member, and allow you to make various reports, reports for management and for your customer. We will also look at some of them. Let's start with the Scrum team. There are three links in a Scrum team. It's the product owner, it's the development team, and it's the Scrum master. And let's talk in more detail about each of these members of our Scrum team and what they do. Product owner manages the product backlog. Next, we'll take a closer look at what it is. But for you to understand, it's just a set of requirements that we generally have to implement completely in order to make our product is ready. This backlog is constantly updated. New features, new user stories, new requirements are added to it. But it is the product owner who collects these requirements and, let's say, describes the backlog, clarifies it, makes it transparent and understandable for the development team, which in the future will be engaged in the implementation of this functionality, this user story. In pure Scrum, there's no such position as a business analyst. So basically, the product officer does the tasks of a business analyst to some extent, Yes, despite the fact that in many Scrum companies there is such a role as a business analyst, but when we talk about pure Scrum, there is no such specialist, no such separate, let's say, allocation. We have a product officer. That is, the main task of the product owner is to collect our backlog, to bring it into such a form that all. Members of the Scrum development team, team understood requirements that they need to realize. Also, product owner prioritizes the execution of these tasks in our, let's say, backlog so that we understand what we do first, what we do second. And basically, those are these are the kind of basic tasks of a product owner. The next link is the development team or the development team. Usually, we have about three to nine people in the development team, so we don't need more than that. We don't recommend to include more people in this development team because the more people we have in our team, the more we have, let's say, dispersion of attention. And our team ceases to be as flexible as it would be if the team was much smaller. So what should be emphasized about the development team? The fact that this 
part of our Scrum team is self-organizing. In other words, we don't need any leader to tell us what we need to do. All team members have an equal influence on what are we going to do. Every voice of a team member needs to be heard and we self-organize as a result of working in one iteration or another in sprints and in general while working on a project. When we talk about cross-functionality, this is the next aspect. It means that every team member possesses all the competencies needed to do anything at all within your team. That is to say, we do not separate our team members into developers, into testers, or into analysts. That is, we, uh, we assert that if this person needs, for instance, to write code, he or she will be able to write it even though he or she is primarily a tester. Yes, of course, you might think now that this scenario seems somewhat ideal um, when we still maintain some degree of specificity or specification, let's say, of the people who work within the team. Yes, that's the way it is, actually. It is extremely rare that absolutely all the team members have absolutely the same competence in all the issues related to requirements, analysis, development, testing, and usually just some person, let's take the same tester, he performs most of the tasks related to testing. But we should strive to ensure that we still have guys in the team who perform absolutely all the functions and can cover them in case, for example, if one of the team members gets sick. So that can happen as well. So it's perfect Scrum, pure Scrum. We just memorize for ourselves how it should work in an ideal world. And what we should remember is that there is such a concept as collective responsibility. That is, for example, even if you are a tester there, so you are essentially responsible for the quality of the product. But we should always remember that every participant in the team is responsible for the quality of the product. That is even including the laws of some simple logic, we can say that. In principle, the developer allowed the probability that we have some bug in code in its implementation that is in fact he's also responsible for this quality even though for example when the tester misses this bug and could not find it in full at the right time in the right place because as we remember exhaustive testing is impossible and it is impossible to release a product that won't have any box at all. In any case, something will come up at some point. So we have to remember this, that everyone is collectively responsible for creating our increment. Increment is this one piece of our functionality plus all the other functionality that has been previously implemented. It's called an increment. Next, we will talk about it in a little bit more detail. And there is also such a role as a Scrum Master. So this is a separate person. It's also called a servant leader. So this is a person who facilitates the work in the team according to the Scrum. That is, he knows absolutely everything about Scrum, how it should work, what the main stages are. We have in Scrum what ceremonies, what artifacts. He helps us, teaches us in case we have any questions related to Scrum, how it should be realized, guides us. But he is not involved in the development of our increment. He just gives us advice and can tell us how we can do things better. Our task as the development team, which basically decides how we will behave during the iteration, what we will do, by what deadline we will implement it, how we will evaluate certain requirements, how we will prioritize them. After they have been prioritized, for example, by the product owner, he just helps us that is, the Scrum Master facilitates the work of the team and is responsible for making sure that we work according to the Scrum if we have such a process adopted in the company. So most likely, when you come to the company, for example, as a newcomer and everything will really work according to Scrum, the Scrum Master will teach you, train you, tell you how it should work, tell you how the processes are organized in your company and will, let's say, morally support you so that you do not have any questions related to the functioning of the Scrum. Scrum within your team, within your project. The next aspect is events that we have in Scrum. First of all, let's talk about what a sprint is in general. Either you may often hear a name like iteration. 
A sprint is a certain time period, about two minus four weeks, that is on average, during which we create an increment of a product that is ready for use, that is that already fully meets the requirements that we take into work during the sprint, and that we can say with complete confidence at the end of the sprint that they are ready to be used by our end user or our customer. And we have four, let's say, events that are tied to this sprint. This is, first of all, sprint planning or iteration planning. You may also come across that name. It's a daily scrum, daily stand-up. You also see that name. The sprint review, sprint review, and retrospectives. Let's talk to you in more detail about each of these ceremonies. So what is sprint planning? We usually have our entire Scrum team come together for sprint planning, which means product owner, development team, and uh, Scrum master. It is held exactly at the beginning of our sprint. And during this planning, we decide what our increment will be at the end of our sprint. And how to organize our work during this iteration here to get a finished product increment. Next, we're going to look at what the backlog is, but just so you understand, that is during our sprint planning, we have a product backlog where we store absolutely all the requirements that we have for our product. But during our planning, we choose what requirements we're going to implement during our sprint, what we're going to take into this iteration and what we're going to use to work. This is, let's say, the main goal of this event is to define exactly the sprint backlog from the product backlog. The sprint backlog is already a set of requirements that we will implement in our sprint, in our iteration. There is also such an event, such a ceremony as daily scram or daily, it is also called daily scram. It's usually once a day and at that daily scram you talk about what you did yesterday. What you're going to do today and what are the obstacles you have for the goal fulfillment? That is, if we talk about testing, for example, yesterday I wrote a test case for such and such a user story. Today I will write a test case for the next user story. And what are the obstacles to fulfill this goal? For example, it's not entirely clear to me how developers will implement data, user story. So what I want to do today is to contact, for example, the developer who's tasked with this requirement and find out from him how it's going to be implemented, what he's going to do. That's what you're saying. If you don't know how to get rid of that obstacle, for example, you don't know what you need to do, the team comes to your aid and tells you how we can help you when you have this or that obstacle or hurdle to realize your goal, for example, for today, goes through for each member of your development team. They talk about all the work they have planned or done and uh, the problems they have encountered. And it usually takes about 15 minutes every day just to keep your hand on the pulse and know what you're working on right now. We uh, also have a sprint review, which is the task of which is to summarize what we did during our sprint. We do a kind of review of what we implemented. During this sprint, checking if all tasks were completed and all user stories were closed. So we are on this, let's say. That's what we're discussing. It is also worth mentioning that there is also such a thing as demo or demonstration of our increment to our product owner or to the customer, depending on how you have this process organized. And you don't want to confuse the fact that at the sprint review, we have to show how that increment works, show that demo. This is usually a separate event that takes place after the sprint review. And in principle, we will not discuss it inside the Scrum now. You just show this or that user story, demo it to the product owner, for example. And he says, yes, everything is really implemented the way we want it. So these are small demonstrations like this. Depending on the company, it can be after the sprint review itself when you show absolutely all the user stories that you have. Implemented in the course of this iteration or, for example, by the degree of fulfillment of all the user stories, that is, you have fulfilled one particular user story, you have carried out demo, did the second user story, did demo, that is, you can do it. Not in one event, but just on the outcome of when you do and 
do this or that user story that is you develop it, validate it during the testing process, and then you show it to your product owner. I hope I have clearly explained what this is. And there is also such an event as a retrospective. Again, you should not confuse a sprint review with a retrospective. You'll see why in a moment. Because in the retrospective, we have the main goal is that we find out. Again, whether we have accomplished all the tasks, but in relation to people, to the development team. And in this meeting, we find out what we could have improved based on the results of your iteration that you participated in. So you answer a series of questions, usually. How, for example, I have this set up in my company or how it was set up in a company where the I used to work before. We have a board that's divided into four, let's say, columns. In the first column, we write down what we did well in the sprint. In the second column, we write what problems we had were in the sprint. Next, we write uh, how we can improve performance. That is how we can improve those problems. We come up with some action items. And uh, if, for example, we have some ideas during the retrospective, because usually we prepare for the retrospective and come up with action items before the retrospective. So if we get these ideas already in the course of it, then again, we add this one to the board. Usually we just put some stickers, for example, if we are talking about retrospective, when we have offline, let's say all the team members are present. But due to the current situation with the coronavirus, we are working remotely now. That is, we just check the screen and write down all these, let's say, problems or some good things that we had and choose a certain top. The main ones, maybe some of the team members have the same problems if they're the same. Then we pick that top and decide how we can improve that. Come up with some action items that are carried over necessarily into the next iteration. And we have to, in that iteration, improve our process in a way that solves that problem. We appoint, let's say, responsible persons for this action item. And we will also find out in the next retrospective whether we were actually able to get rid of this problem, what was done. If we could not, and this problem remains, for example, and it is critical for us, then we again move it to the next iteration. And again, we decide what we're going to do, how we are going to work on this problem. This is, let's say, the main four ceremonies that we have associated with the sprint. I would also like to draw your attention to artifacts. Today, we have already talked a lot about the product backlog. That is about the user stories that we have to realize in order for our product to be released, let's say. Absolutely all the user stories, absolutely all the requirements that our customers have and that the product owner has added to our backlog. We're going to see how Jira implements this a little bit further so that you have a picture of how you can track this in front of you. Attached to the backlog is, shall we say, such a ceremony as product backlog refinement. Product backlog refinement. What is it in general? The main purpose of this event is to refine, evaluate, and organize the elements in the product backlog. That is, for example, a scrum team and a product owner get together, and the product owner presents you some new user stories he has written. And if you have any questions, if you don't understand something, you ask the product owner questions, and he explains it. And in case you need to rework this or that user story, it reworks it so that it is clear and clear to you how this user story will be realized. For example, in my team at Refinements, we also evaluate user stories, which we will talk about uh, with you a little bit later. That is, we decide how many so, called story points we assign to this or that story. That is, in essence, it is the difficulty of executing this or that user story, but not the time we spend on its execution. Next, I will tell you about such a thing as poker planning, and you will probably understand a little bit more what I am talking about. There are also aspects such as preparedness criteria and readiness criteria. How are they different? Because sometimes the question arises, we hear the definition of ready and the definition of done. And in the Russian translation, you can find just criteria of readiness. And we do not understand at all what this refers to. And let's take a moment to compare what the readiness criteria and the readiness criteria are. The readiness criteria are specifically focused on the backlog level. In other words, we evaluate the user stories that are provided to us by the product owner to determine how well we understand them and how clearly they are spelled out. 
for instance, we check for any inconsistencies according to the properties of good requirements, which we discussed in detail in the previous lesson on. Requirements testing. Now the link will appear at the top, allowing you to refresh your memory a little bit about the features we have. So these are specifically tailored towards the user story, our backlog. These definition of ready properties assist the customer in crafting well-written user stories that are prepared for development. When we discuss the definition of ready criteria and the definition of done, they already concentrate on the sprint or release level. And they are already directly related to the assessment of the degree of readiness of our functionality. For instance, if we set the readiness criteria at the moment, let's say before iteration planning, then we use the definition of done at iteration planning. During sprint planning, here we establish some key points by which we will assess whether this or that functionality is ready or not. That is our definition of done helps. Verify the work against all the requirements of the project, not just demonstrate that the functionality works. For example, the definition of done might include the following, that we have integration tests written and they all pass. We have unit tests written and they all pass. For example, we have less than 10% of critical bugs. That is, we choose such criteria of product readiness definition of done that allow us to evaluate what we have ready, this or that area of work, this or that functionality and we use exactly the readiness criteria in this case. I'd also like to draw your attention to user stories. Again, we talked about this when we discussed analyzing requirements and testing them. Let me remind you a little bit of what they look like. So user stories are basically an intense statement that describes something that the system should do for the user. So in the first approximation, it is some requirement that we have to realize. And it consists of the following. Some role in the system that is as some role in the system. I can do something for something. Doing something is some functionality that we have prescribed in user story. And for something is some value to, let's say, our business. For example, as new users in the system, I'd like to buy a phone to please myself. Let's say we have a user story like this here. They are described like this. That is, there is a basic statement. And then we have acceptance criteria. That is acceptance criteria, where we describe in detail how this functionality will be implemented in order to achieve this value for the business. And usually these acceptance criteria, when we talk about testing, we take them into account and test each of these acceptance criteria. We have to describe in our test cases every acceptance criteria if we're talking about any positive scenarios. Well, also based on that, we write our negative scenarios. And we can use them, for example, to design extended tests, extended tests, extended testing. That is, we take into account the acceptance criteria and test in the same way as all the other requirements that come to us for review. According to the properties of good requirements that you and I have already talked about. Next, what else I'd like to tell you about is poker scheduling. As I said, we evaluate our user stories. We rate them by complexity. And let's say we rate them in these abstract things called story points. There are several ways to rate our user stories. One of the most popular is poker planning. Let's take a look with you what that looks like. There are a number of online tools that allow us to evaluate these user stories. That is, we create a room where we specify all the user stories that we are going to implement that we have to evaluate, for example. For example, at the literacy plenary or, for example, at the reflection, depending on how it is organized in your company. And there is a series of numbers this is the so-called Fibonacci series, that is, that is, so you understand. Usually in the Fibonacci series we use, the first two numbers are either 0, 0, or 1, 1, for example, and the next numbers that follow. The first two numbers, they are the sum of the previous two numbers, and so we have this Fibonacci series. 
And we already have these story points. What are story points? They are such abstract numbers that allow us to estimate the complexity of execution and realization of our story point, of our requirement, of our user story. So we get some user story and the whole development team uh, development team gets together and they decide how many story points to assign. We have this decision if we're talking about, for example, a team that took place based on our previous experience. For example, in the last iteration, we had to develop a registration page, which we spent this certain amount of time on. And we have the second one, we have user story, which appeared in this iteration. For example, here we already have the functionality of password reset. Here we have, for example, the functionality of password update. The functionality of, for example, updating your account name, your login, for example, in the system. And you and I compare these two racks. So we have the first one, for example, we gave it one story point in the last iteration. And we compare how much more complicated compared to this first counter where we just registered the system, the second counter, where we already have much more acceptance criteria. And we assign them this story point. That is, depending on what kind of experience the developer has, what kind of experience, for example, the tester has. How long has he been working on the project? Is it a new person or not? He can have absolutely different story points. After that, when all the members of our development team have voted, we see if these story points coincide. If our vision of the complexity and realization of this rack coincides, and if we get some, let's say, drop-offs, for example, someone voted one and someone voted 13, for example, for this story point, we start a discussion and people explain exactly why they voted that way. And in case, for example, after this explanation, we have the same, let's say, ideas. That is, someone can convince someone that, yes, indeed, there is not one story point, but 13. You and I re-vote and again look at how we voted, and so for each user story. And more team members have voted equally and evenly, and there are no more of these big dropouts. We decide how many story points to assign to each user story. That is in no way says how much time we have to perform this or that user story, because often many people are mistaken when they say that story points are tied to time. No, it's a tie to the difficulty of performing a particular task based on some of our previous experience. I hope I've made that clear to you. So here are these ways to evaluate and assign story points in our user story. Also, for example, some teams use uh, jerseys, jersey sizes. So there's XS, there's S, there's M, there's L, there's XL. So we can also use t-shirts, for example, to assess the difficulty of a task. We can also evaluate, for example, the size of dogs. That is, again, there is a list of some dogs, for example, starting from a Chihuahua and ending with a Tibetan Mastiff. That is, we have such a row in which the size of a dog will be responsible for the size of a given user. I mean, that happens too. And coming back to our backlogs, we talked to you about the product backlog. That is where we keep absolutely all the requirements that we have for our product that we're developing. There's also a sprint backlog. As I said, we choose exactly what we're going to implement. In this sprint, that is, we just drag and drop from the backlog of the product backlog to the backlog of the sprint. Next, I'll tell you how you can calculate exactly, let's say, the maximum number of story points that we can fit into our sprint backlog, because that will determine how many tasks how many user stories we can take into the development of a given iteration. Product increment, like I said, is everything that we've developed before. And we'll develop at the end of this iteration, meaning you never have to say that product increment is exactly what we're developing in this particular of the iteration, and we'll provide it to the customer when it's finished. Product increment is everything that we have already developed before this iteration, plus this part. Of those legacy features, those functionalities that we will develop in this particular iteration. And another aspect is the various metrics that we use, which regulate, for example, how many tasks we can take on in a particular iteration, how quickly we can accomplish them, and generally view. In dynamics, how it changes. Let's say the number of tasks that we complete over time. So 
The first characteristic I'd like to tell you about is velocity. This is velocity of our Scrum team. It is calculated as the arithmetic average of the completed story points in the previous sprints. So, for example, we have a new team and we don't know the velocity because, for example, we haven't finished the first iteration yet. So we take a certain number of story points in a given iteration, execute them, and see how many we were able to execute, and so on with each iteration. And then when we have a certain amount of historical data, we can collect the arithmetic average over these several iterations and say that according to the statistics, we can, for example, take 30 story points per iteration, no more, no less. And we set this goal. So we can take more, for example, in the next iteration for the same iteration planning more than we have in our speed. And the next characteristic is capacity or capacity, the amount of available time of team members. How is it calculated? That is, we simply take here those hours that we have per iteration for each specific full-time developer in our development team. That is, if we have, for example, an iteration takes 10 days, of which we know that we have two days off, we subtract these two days off from 10, we are left with eight days, and we know that the working day, for example, uh, we have eight hours, so we are eight, multiply by eight, and we get the figure 64 hours. That is our capacity, our capacity per developer. And we multiply these 64 hours, for example, by the total number of developers in our team, and again, this helps us with our sprint planning. Again, we need to put different risks in here because of the fact that, for example, here we have a pandemic right now that speed and capacity, for example, may depend on the fact that some team members may get sick. So we pay attention to that as well. Again, capacity may decrease because we get some holidays. Again, we're taking these holidays away from it. That is, we put all of this in right away and we assess the risks before we plan this or that iteration. This is usually done by the Scrum Master. But just to let you know that there are such characteristics as speed and capacity. And then there are two other metrics like the burn down chart and the commodity flow diagram. You and I will look at them a little bit when we look at JIRA. So let's go over to JIRA with you and see how this can look at all visually in buck tracking and in a project management system, let's say. I sincerely hope that you have already downloaded JIRA or rather that you have registered for it since we discussed issues related to. With the design of backtracking reports in the 10 lesson, and you should already be a bit used to the interface of this backtracking. So let's go straight to the backlog tab. Here we already have some project created and we have a backlog. I've created hypothetically several user stories. So this is basically our backlog of the product where we have several stories. I also created a sprint directly and we can easily redirect, let's say using drag and drop our stacks into our sprint. And now we have in our sprint backlog three user stories that we have to fulfill. We can go to the board of our project and see that we have two user stories in total status. In order for us to see how they can be dragged further, I have dragged one of the total stories to the D1 status. That is when, for example, we have already developed everything, tested it, and have shown, for example, a demo. And our product owner has approved that, yes, indeed, this story has been tried and done correctly, according to those requirements, those user story acceptance criteria in which he prescribed. This is roughly what our board looks like exactly in Scrum. Of course, there can be many more stats, many more, let's say, columns from which we can pull some or other user stories. Also here during our development, we can have different shuffles, bugs can appear, which we also transfer by drag and drop from one status to another, that is, all this can be done visually here too. There is nothing complicated about it. Just to get you a little bit used to how it can look like. And in the user story itself, we have, as we see with you, a story point. That is, 
when you and I have evaluated this uh, the user story, we add this evaluation. Because this evaluation, we later influence various graphs and reports so that the product owner, the Scrum Master, can understand how far we are moving towards the goal, whether we are on time or not, and can later suggest some corrective, let's say, measures in order to, to improve our work. And there is also such a tab as reports, and here we have various kinds of analytical, statistical things. First of all, you might be interested in looking at the burndown chart and the commodity flow diagram. There's also a velocity chart, that is, how our velocity changes during an iteration. There are also various charts and reports that allow management to evaluate team performance and somehow influence it in case we see some drawdowns. If we talk about burn down chart, then here we simply collect the number of story points that we take in our iteration. That is, for example, we have laid down six story points. That is the sum of all story points in our user stories is six. And we have, let's say, our ideal chart, how it should decrease. That is, we should gradually decrease the number of story points and take them to work so that everything would be smooth. And when, for example, we have something beyond this line, we can analyze it. For example, Scrum Master can analyze it and provide a decision to the management on how it can be improved, what influenced it can communicate. For example, with the team on how we can improve it, why we had such a jump. In other words, the management of all these charts is already doing the analysis. So, for example, a tester, a developer, just for general development to understand where the team is at right now, you can go in there and look at that. As for this cumulative flow diagram, it looks a little bit different here. That is, again, we have a legend here. How many entities, let's say, items are in todo status? How many items are in in progress status and how many items are in done status. So again, you and I can monitor all this, see if we really finish our iteration on time. Let's say if the number of our items in the todo status is decreasing, how many items are in the done status? That is all this we can also analyze. And the management also understands if we really fulfill our goal if we have time in the iteration to close all the tests that we have planned and how we can improve our process as a whole so that we don't have these issues in the future. That's probably all I wanted to tell you in this big, shall we say, overview related to Agile and in particular related to Scrum. I will leave you a link to Planity Poker so that you can see what this tool is and how it works. I'll leave you a link to the Agile Manifesto so that you can also familiarize yourself with it, read about the principles, read about the values that are in the Agile Manifesto. I will also give you a link to the Scrum Guide, which you should also read because here is a detailed description. Of what I told you today, let's say so briefly, plus there are some additional things that I didn't pay attention to because I think that for a beginner tester, you don't need to dive into these points very much, but for general development, you should read it because it is a fundamental document to implement Scrum in your company and to comply with it. The requirements that we have spelled out in this guide, and I'll also leave a link to Kanban guide, which we haven't talked to you about today. I've never worked with it with Kanban. I have a rough idea of what it means. If you will be interested, I can record a small video about Kanban. But for this, you don't need also to prepare, but you can also read it. That is here as well as about Scrum, all the basic aspects that are required to. This framework are spelled out, so it is also on merit. Read about, it's definitely not going to be redundant. And at the end of our class, I would like to congratulate you once again on the fact that we have finished the course of Tester from scratch. And in fact, already now you can apply for positions in different companies. Respond, try to get an interview, try to communicate with recruiters, make sure you have a page in LinkedIn, design your resume, design a cover letter. So it's a great time for you to start looking for jobs. Once again, I advise you to revisit those videos that you did not learn very well 
practice on the various resources that we talked about in this course. Practice on various sites, that is, just go to the site, choose the registration form and test, test, test. Make test cases, make checklists, make bug reports, download the mobile application, test it according to the features and testing of mobile applications that we talked about. Spoke with you as well. Discover some bugs, ask me questions, inquire in our Telegram channels, which are specifically dedicated to assisting you in understanding various aspects of testing. You can message me on Instagram. Once again, all the links are provided just like in the video description, so they will appear on the screen shortly. Don't hesitate to chat, chat, explore, Google, 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 Google and find answers to your questions. And I truly hope that this course and these lessons will genuinely assist you in understanding testing and securing your first job. I'll see you very soon. We will begin to delve into uh, uh, various aspects of testing more thoroughly and learn how to utilize the different tools that I employ in my work. We will communicate, share positive emotions and grow together. This is the most important thing. And as is our tradition, please come to our shala. Bye.